Hello, I am uh, Juan de Pablo, the Executive Vice President for Science, Innovation, National Labs, and Global Initiatives at the University of Chicago. I am happy to welcome you to the Joint Forum on Addressing the Climate and Energy Challenge, hosted by the University of Chicago and Peking University. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. To listen to today's program in Mandarin, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select Chinese. To hear the program in English, again, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select English. Please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit questions in either Chinese or English throughout the event. It is my pleasure to introduce the president of the University of Chicago, Paul Alivisatos. President Alivisatos joined the University of Chicago in September of 2021 as our 14th president. He previously served as the executive vice chancellor and provost at the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to his leadership position, President Alivisatos is a preeminent scientist and entrepreneur who has made many pioneering research breakthroughs in nanomaterials. Without further ado, President Alivisatos. Good evening and good morning. On behalf of the University of Chicago, it's a true pleasure to welcome you to the seventh US China Forum and first U Chicago PKU Joint Forum addressing the climate and energy challenge. Each year, the University of Chicago comes together with um, experts from China and from the United States for an exploration for how our two nations, cultures, and societies intersect across a variety of topics. This year's event is exciting. We've joined forces with Peking University's prestigious Beijing Forum to bring this unique content to an even broader audience. Whether it be at the local, the national, or the global level, one of my priorities as president of the University of Chicago is to ensure that our university becomes a connected and engaged collaborator with partners around the world. The most important challenges facing our world today are inherently global. The scale of the climate and energy challenge requires that larger conversations around policy and science be driven by international level understanding and collaboration. While the circumstances around the issues may differ across national borders, we do need to work together to leverage the knowledge, the technology, and the experiences that our institutions bring to generate new ideas that will help transform our communities at home and abroad for the better. From early collaborations on medical education to today's research in energy and environment, to early childhood development, to topics of economics and finance, art history, culture, and beyond, the University of Chicago has a deep tradition of collaboration, genuine and deep productive collaboration with our Chinese partners. I would like to extend my gratitude to the China United States Exchange Foundation for their annual support and collaboration on this forum. In addition, I would like to thank Peking University for their longstanding partnership, along with the numerous other partners and contributors who have helped to make today's event possible. I think we will have a wonderful, engaging, and ultimately actionable exchange over the coming weeks. It is now my pleasure to introduce remarks from the distinguished president of Peking University, Mr. Gong Chi Wang. Shoshan 
，但是我相信本次论坛一定会精彩纷呈。芝加哥大学和北京大学都创办于十九世纪末，在百余年的历史洗礼中，两校都为促进学术发展和文明进步贡献了重要力量，在推动大学的国际合作与交流上开展了一系列积极行动。两校之间也有着悠久的历史渊源。上世纪二十年代，一批芝加哥大学的中国留学生回国后在北大任教，对北大的发展起到了重要的推动作用。例如，我本人所在的物理专业，严任光、饶玉泰、周培远等泰斗都曾在芝加哥大学学习。其中，曾任北京大学校长的周培远先生。在北大创办了中国第一个力学专业，今年是他诞辰一百二十周年。他实事求是、锲而不舍的为人品格和为学理念，至今依然是北大宝贵的精神财富。中国有句成语叫“历久弥新”，北京大学和芝加哥大学之间的深厚友谊，近年来更加富有生机活力。过去二十年间，北京大学和芝加哥大学的交流日趋紧密，在学术交流、学生培养等方面都有着密切合作，形成了长期而坚固的伙伴关系。两年前，北京大学成立了第一个海外中心——北京大学芝加哥中心，进一步深化了北大与芝大的伙伴关系。这次以“应对气候与能源挑战”为主题举办联合论坛。则是两校合作的又一里程碑。众所周知，气候与能源问题是全球性的挑战，没有一个国家能够独善其身，也无法凭一己之力解决。密切合作、携手应对是各国的共识，而大学作为重要的创新策源地，更要在应对气候与能源挑战中履行自身的学术使命和担当。我们非常高兴地看到，此次联合论坛依托芝加哥大学“中美论坛”和北京大学“北京论坛”的智力资源和学术资源，汇聚了气候变化领域的知名学者、行业领袖和有影响力的政策制定者，共同探讨这一重大的时代课题。我们期待论坛的精彩对话，推动各方更加全面、深入的思考。人类与自然如何和谐共处，为促进文明的和谐与共同繁荣，构建更加美好的世界，做出新贡献。最后，非常感谢芝加哥大学各位同仁的通力合作，也预祝本次联合论坛取得圆满成功。谢谢大家。I would like to introduce our next guest, the Consul General. Of the People's Republic of China in Chicago, Mr. Zhao Tian, Consul General Zhao is the 11th Consul General and covers nine states throughout the Midwest. He promotes and supervises mutually beneficial cooperation and exchanges throughout the region, thus contributing to the development of China-U.S. relations. Please join me in welcoming Consul General Zhao. Thank you, Mr. Vice President,、uh, President. Alvi Satos, President Gong Qi Huang, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening and good morning. It is my great pleasure to attend the joint forum on addressing the climate and energy challenge. Since its inception, the U.S.-China Forum at the University of Chicago has served as a bridge of communication, featuring inspiring discussion. On issues concerning China-U.S. relations and sustainable development, on behalf of the Chinese Consulate General in Chicago, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the University of Chicago and all the people who have worked to enhance the China-U.S. mutual understanding and mutually beneficial cooperation, and have made this forum a success. This year marks the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's visit to China. Over the past five decades, China-U.S. relations have braved wind and rain and continued to move forward. 
which have not only brought great benefits to our two peoples, but also made important contributions toward peace, stability, and prosperity. China-U.S. relations have gone well beyond the bilateral scope and carry important implications for the whole world. It has been proven time and again that cooperation serves the interests of the two countries, while confrontation will only hurt both. President Xi Jinping pointed out that whether China and the U.S. can handle their relationship well bears on the future of the world. It is a question of the century to which our two countries must provide a good answer. And the international community and the people all over the world also expect China and the U.S. to maintain healthy and stable bilateral relationship, advance global cooperation, protect world peace, stability, and promote global development and prosperity. Such are the responsibilities that both China and the U.S. should shoulder as major countries in the world. China is the largest developing country in the world, and its development is to constantly meet people's ever-growing aspirations for a better life. To achieve this goal, we will always adhere to the people-centered development philosophy, realize Chinese-style modernization with high-quality development, pursue the green and low-carbon development path that prioritizes ecological conservation, promote harmonious coexistence of man and nature, and work with other countries around the world to foster the global development partnership and build a shared future for all life on Earth. China has announced the targets of carbon peaking and carbon neutrality, and it will make the greatest reduction in carbon emission intensity in the world in the shortest time span in human history. China has over fulfilled the climate action goals committed for the year 2020 and has put forth new nationally determined contributions. China has, un has, unwaving has unwaveringly committed to trees planting and forest restoration, developing clean and renewable energy, has put carbon dioxide emissions under strict control and established the largest national carbon market in terms of the volume of greenhouse gas emissions. China has engaged extensively in international cooperation on climate change. We advocate following the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, moving faster to meet the temperature goals set out in the Paris Agreement, implementing the Global Development Initiative, and working with all parties for a green silk road. As President Xi Jinping pointed out that everyone living on Earth is a part of a big family and humanity is one community. And that climate change is a common challenge, challenge to all. And we humanity must come together to rise to that challenge. China will work with other countries around the world to promote and practice true multilateralism with each other, with each doing its best and all working in solidarity. With real efforts, we will be able to protect our shared planet and leave a better world to future generations. I hope and believe that this forum will be a greater success in building consensus and promoting international cooperation. I also sincerely hope that China and the United States would respectively and collectively play constructive roles in promoting green, low carbon and sustainable development for the benefit of our two peoples and the people of the whole world. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Greenstone. Michael is a Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics and the College at the University of Chicago. And he's the director of the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics and the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Michael studies the global challenge, the global energy challenge, which requires societies to expand access to inexpensive and reliable energy 
while minimizing local environmental quality impacts and avoiding disruptive climate change. Please join me in welcoming Professor Greenstone. Uh, thanks very much, Juan. It's uh, my great honor to be able to participate in this event tonight. Uh, the real stars are coming, but I thought I would say, uh, just talk for a minute about, uh, so I, I lead the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago, and as Juan just said, our work centers around confronting the global energy challenge, uh, which is something that all societies face, and it, re it requires every society to find a way to balance the urgent and critical need for uh, reliable and inexpensive sources of energy, while limiting uh, local air pollution uh, that causes health problems and uh, preventing disruptive climate change. And to do that, uh, what we set out to do when, we, uh, when I came to the university and started running the Energy Policy Institute was the, made a very conscious choice to focus on three regions in the world. Uh, they were uh, the United States, uh, China and India. And our view is that these are the most important places in the world uh, for the uh, global energy challenge. Uh, and that this is an area, energy and environment, uh, like many others, uh, where we're kind of all in this together. Uh, and each country can benefit the world and each other. And a key role for universities in all of this is that the best way to do that is by developing new ideas. Uh, and new ideas are kind of the lifeblood of finding ways to uh, achieve this delicate balance. And they're also something that don't respect borders. Uh, ideas jump across borders all the time. And so a lot of our focus has been on uh, developing uh, new ideas. Uh, we launched Epic China uh, in 2019 uh, alongside a partnership with the University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. This partnership has aimed to advance some of the world's most critical energy and climate challenges in a way that neither institute could tackle on their own. Uh, and since that time, it's been a very uh, fruitful and uh, this is a fruitful and productive relationship uh, alongside and in collaboration with and holding hands with Chinese scholars. Uh, we've been uncovering important insights that I think are relevant for China and are uh, relevant for other countries, the United States, India, and other parts of the world that are uh, working to find a way to uh, balance, to solve this global energy challenge. Just to give you a flavor of some of the things that have emerged in this research, uh, we found that China's new automated monitoring technology uh, for air pollution improves pollution data and transparency. Uh, and has increased citizen, Chinese citizens' efforts to better protect themselves by purchasing masks and air purifiers, and has underscored uh, the central role that governments can play in providing their citizens uh, their citizens with information that they need. Uh, a second thing that we found is that when the public has information about local polluters, uh, they can participate in environmental enforcement uh, through social media, and that's been quite effective. And perhaps most importantly, uh, we found that China's strong efforts after declaring a war on pollution in 2014 have led to very dramatic improvements uh, in air quality uh, in China. And indeed, if these uh, improvements are sustained, the average Chinese citizen is expected to live about two years longer. Uh, and that's thanks to about a 40% decline in particulate pollution. And two years longer is really an enormous accomplishment. Uh, so all of this research allows citizens and leaders alike to make more informed choices, uh, and it just would not have been possible without this hand-in-hand -hand collaboration uh, with our colleagues in China. Uh, and it is indeed the same spirit of collaboration and style collaboration that is needed at the macro level to grap grapple with the larger energy and climate challenges, which brings us to our conversation today. Uh, and so I want to introduce our really kind of rock star set of uh, panel participants here. Uh, Jonathan Pershing uh, is the Program Director uh, of Environment at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Previously, Jonathan served as a Deputy Climate Envoy for the Biden administration and had a similar role under President Obama. Few people know the ins and outs of climate diplomacy better than he does. He was instrumental in successfully negotiating landmark climate change deals such as the Glasgow Climate Pact, the Paris Agreement, uh, as well as a truly historic climate agreement between China and the United States. 
Uh, Zhou Ji is the CEO and president of the Energy Foundation in China. I've been fortunate to be able to work with him uh, through the years. He previously served as a deputy director general of China, uh, China's National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation and led international climate negotiations and collaboration, uh, including the Paris Agreement. He also played a lead authorship role in the IPCC reports. Uh, and finally, uh, to moderate, we have Lisa Friedman. Uh, she is a star climate policy reporter for the New York Times, and we are very proud to say a journalism fellow at EPIC. Uh, Lisa has covered 10 international climate talks. Uh, she probably could talk for hours about them uh, and knows the issues and mechanics behind international, international climate policy inside and out. And so with all that, let me step aside. Uh, and let's let the experts take over. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, Lisa, and Zoji. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I uh, everyone is visible, and I am so thrilled to be um, to be moderating this conversation today. I'm Lisa Friedman. I promise that I will not talk endlessly about <laughs> UN climate conferences. And I'm sure that uh, both Jonathan Pershing and Joshi give me a run for the, my money on, on numbers attended. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be moderating this discussion. You, you have the, the bios of both our esteemed panelists. These two former negotiators for their countries are still deeply involved in, in climate policy. And this discussion about the United States and China could not come at a more important time. We are headed uh, on, on in November and early November to into global climate negotiations. Once again, uh, it's the 27th conference of the parties, COP27 in UN parlance, uh, will be held in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. Uh, the, the climate negotiations come as Russia continues to wage war on Ukraine, and the world is grappling with the crises that are reverberating from that war, including a global energy crisis, uh, impending famine in, in the Horn of Africa. Um, and, and into that mix we, comes a, uh, a relationship with the United States and China that is on the rocks. Uh, China has suspended cooperation with the United States over the visit by Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives to Taiwan. Um, and as I'm sure our panelists will, will agree, the U.S.-China relationship, and as we've heard here already this evening, um, has been has been pivotal, pivotal to the rest of the world moving forward on climate change. Um, it arguably made the United States uh, and China cooperation and, and statement together arguably made the Paris Agreement possible. It elevated the Glasgow conference last year um, when they issued a joint, joint statement. And, and so to discuss the way forward with the United States and China, Jonathan Pershing, Zhao Ji, let's, let's talk about the way forward. Um, Maybe, Zhao Ji, can we start with you? Tell us what the state of U.S.-China relations right now on climate change is, and why is it important for the U.S. and China to work together on climate change? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for your question. Uh, but certainly, no need to say uh, it is very, very important for China US to cooperate in climate uh, field. Uh, no need to say uh, we are the top two uh, economies in the world and also top two uh, emitters of uh, greenhouse gas e uh, emission. Uh, that said, uh, oh, we should be also aware of the fact that uh, US is the top one developed country than the China the top one developing country okay. and the the uh, these reflect the uh, i mean the the major components of the solution and the uh, uh, effectiveness uh, for the whole world to fight against the climate change uh without the co cooperation uh between china and the us uh, we cannot imagine where 
will be the way out uh, for uh, global climate solution. And uh, also, if we rec uh, record the, uh, the, the history, at least in the past uh, 10 years, uh, of the, the global climate agenda development, uh, it's very obvious China-US uh, cooperation really made great contribution uh, to this multilateral uh, uh, process. Especially uh, myself, I experienced uh, the whole process uh, together with Jonathan and many other colleagues. I mean, the whole process of uh, the Paris Agreement negotiation. And uh, it, it, it is true, I mean, without the cooperation between China and the US, uh, it will be maybe we should, uh, we, we, we have to take longer time to reach such a fantastic agreement, although it's very difficult, but we, we reach it. So this shows uh, it is very important. But when you say the, uh, the current status, unfortunately, I would say the current status is so poor. I mean, for the general bilateral uh, relation and these has very direct uh, spillover effects on the cooperation of climate. So we should uh, find some solution to figure out that. Thank you. Yeah. Jonathan, I mean, the Paris Agreement is set. The United States has policies to address climate change. China has policies to address climate change. Why, in your mind, is joint cooperation, you know, needed at, at this point? What what is lost uh, uh, if if the two largest emitters are not are not working together? So uh, thanks very much, Lisa. Um, it's great to be here. I wanted to thank the University of Chicago for organizing this along with Peking University. I think that uh, in some ways, in the absence of some of these formal conversations between the two countries, these informal opportunities for engagement are even more critical. So I think it's really, really quite important that this dialogue is going forward. And I appreciate the universities for helping organize it and Lisa to you for moderating it. Let me come back to the particular question you've asked, because I think it's it's the right one to ask at this moment. What's What kind of scenarios can we imagine? <clears throat> one scenario essentially is a fortress world in which countries all seek individually to solve this problem on their own. But almost all the analysis and many people at the University of Chicago and in Peking and Sochi and his work at the Energy Foundation and at NDRC, I've done some work on this at the US government, we have actually not found a solution where that's successful. There are too many parts of our global economy that are intertwined. There are too many things that each of us need to make progress that require other partners to succeed. So if in fact we wanna make progress at the rate and at the scale that's required, we can't do it by ourselves. And let me elaborate just on a few of the elements that speak to that. United States was instrumental in advancing issues around renewable energy. These are issues that came up at the U.S. Department of Energy's labs. Um, President Alavisatos was uh, running one of those labs, but we've got others in Chicago, which he's now responsible for as well. Uh, things on some of the solid state physics that were developed, the U.S. was a leader. Other countries took that forward as a policy agenda. Germany and Europe uh, among the most critical, where they developed some of the earliest policies to promote the adoption of renewable energy. And then China picked up the mantle and managed to substantially scale up the investment and reduce the price so that now things like solar panels are ubiquitous, available globally, and can penetrate into global economies without substantial cost. And in fact, with a reduced cost below what they would have been absent all of those interventions. We don't actually have all the answers yet. We still need to develop some of those technologies. So a model in which any of us tries to do this on our own is doomed to fail. And yet the climate change agenda is obviously critical. The urgency is obvious and growing and the need for the cooperation therefore becomes more urgent, not less. We need to figure out how we do things like manage variability in our energy supply so we have reliability. All of us have to work on that. We have to think about new technologies, like can I capture carbon from the end use of industry? We all have to work on that. 
And unfortunately, we also won't even that way be to, able to do enough. We have to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to do direct carbon capture from the atmosphere, a technology that we understand is in its infancy, but we'll need every single asset we can bring to the table to succeed on. And the US and China are gonna have to do this jointly or we will fail. So to me, the solution here is collaboration, recognizing that we disagree, recognizing there are enormous areas of tension and conflict. This is not one of those issues that can be put aside while we try to resolve those. We have to work through those and work on this agenda. So, so what kind of role can forums like these play? I mean, I imagine that there are a number of, and, and gentlemen, I hope you'll, you'll tell us, track two, you know, discussions, uh, discussions among um, uh, former government officials and people close to those currently in government. Are, are those still going on and, and are they, are those, if they are, are those discussions sort of informing in governments or are they, or are they simply just not uh, able to take the place of real one-on-one -on -one discussions with negotiators and, and ministers? Jaji? Um, uh, here, uh, in fact, Lisa, you uh, mentioned the matter of the relation between uh, track two, track 1.5 or track one. Uh, but uh, my answer is very simple. Uh, in this situation, uh, track two will play very extremely important role. I mean, to keep uh, the connection and uh, communication uh, between people, I mean, people to people, uh, academia to academia, business to business. Uh, and um, uh, at least uh, these can maintain the connection and to share information uh, and to exchange idea from the perspective of academia. And uh, certainly the ideal uh, result and those messages will be conveyed to policymakers, to governments, and uh, will be helpful for track one. Uh, so uh, in this situation, track two is, is uh, extremely important. So just so, like this one, just like this one. I mean, between University of Chicago and the Peking University, and the Peking uh, between Hewlett Foundation and the Energy Foundation China, between experts, uh, professionals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Jonathan, these are keeping the lines of communication open. Is is this uh, able to to sort of fill the the space for the moment um, between between negotiators that that isn't being filled by governments at the moment? So I think we should be clear about its importance and its limits. It is an essential component of managing the inter interaction and engagement. And it becomes more important when the formal channels are, are stopped or halted or suspended. I don't think it satisfies though. At the end of the day, there's gonna have to be a conversation between the principals in both countries, uh, the heads of state, maybe that will occur on the margins of the G20, maybe that will occur in other settings. We'll have to have conversations between those leading on the climate agenda. Perhaps that's uh, Envoy Kerry and Envoy Xi uh, uh, Jinhua. Perhaps it will be between others who play a, a critical role, the Minister of Energy in China and the Secretary of Energy in the US, or the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator and the MEE uh, head in China. We'll need those because ultimately there's gotta be a formal engagement. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there have been periods of interruption in the past. This is not the first time there have been some difficult negotiations between our countries. And these track two and other mechanisms to continue the dialogue have been essential. Because let's be clear, there are two things that you wanna do. The first one is actually to figure out what you should do. Those are ideas that are not limited to partners in government. Those are ideas that can come from think tanks and from academicians and from experts in business, as Ochi has said. Those have to be developed and as those develop, they can be communicated. In both of our countries, that communication is ongoing. And then you need to have the exchange. How do you find areas of compromise and cooperation? In the informal dialogue, we can identify those. We can propose them, sometimes without the fears of there being formal retaliation or concern because they're informal discussions. But ultimately, you have to get to the place where what do the two countries agree? 
Now they can agree it in two ways. They can agree it bilaterally. That's been the mechanism historically, or they could agree it multilaterally. And that may be the mechanism that we see in the next round. There may be areas where the US and China joining with other parties in Egypt at the next climate negotiations could find some common ground and advance their joint cause through a different process. I'll give a small plug to the New York Times uh, Climate Forward event uh, during Climate Week, uh, which folks can find online if they'd like to see. I interviewed John Kerry on stage. And as you mentioned, he has a personal relationship with, with uh, Xi Jinping, the, the lead negotiator for China. And I asked him if there had been any back channel communication. And, and he said, well, there's been back channel outreach. I I asked him, what does that mean? Have you been texting him? And, uh, and Special Envoy Kerry said, well, no, I, I've, I've emailed. Um, and then he sort of turned to the cameras and said, I just want the Chinese government, if anyone is watching, to know that he hasn't emailed me back. <laughs> um, so there, there certainly seems like there is there are efforts to to continue to engage one another. I, I wonder if if uh, if either of you think that a joint anything between the United States and China is possible at this stage out of COP27. Jonathan? So I'm an internal optimist. Um, I, of course it's possible. Uh, and I think the question of how things have changed in the last few months suggests there may be more room than there was directly following uh, um, Representative Pelosi's visit. I think that the reason for it comes back to the kind of increasing catastrophes that are related to climate that we're seeing around the world. I think there's a recognition on both sides about the urgency. I think China has seen this in terms of the requests it's getting from its partner countries in the BRI community, looking at food crises, looking at energy prices, looking at real constraints. I think it comes out of the US interest in moving the agenda forward as it looks at providing aid to Pakistan, which was inundated with a flood that displaces 30 million people. I think you're seeing it in the pressure from other countries on both the US and China to move forward. So I'm personally of the view that there will be some mechanism here to re-engage. I'm hopeful it happens before Sharm. I'm hopeful if it doesn't happen before, it'll happen during that meeting. And I'm hopeful that a set of things that we might do informally between others could help open up the channel for something constructive. Jay, are you are you similarly optimistic? What, what's your level of optimism? Um, um, I I see the possibility there. Uh, anyway, uh, I mean for G20, for COP27 in Sham. Uh, those are multilateral uh, 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 occasion, and uh, I mean there must be some participants and leaders or uh, principals from the two countries. They will be there in the same meeting room in the lounge, meet in the lounge or uh, coffee uh, cafe or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they have to discuss uh, the common multilateral issue there. Uh, so those are opportunity there, but uh, I would assume if everything's okay, I mean, especially the potential, uh, uh, the political situation will be stable. Uh, so there will be a, a, a opportunity there. I mean, that depends on the atmosphere. So we should create more constructive uh, atmosphere. For the for make those opportunity to, to become reality. I'd like to take a step back a, a moment. Um, you know, as as we've all talked about, we're about to head into to climate negotiations. Last year at COP26 in Glasgow, um, it was a big moment. The the uh, President Biden in the United States had had. Uh, you know, taking the White House, the U.S. was back in the Paris Agreement. Countries were were being asked to update their their emissions targets. Um, there was a lot of attention on that COP. A lot of promises made. A lot of pledges made. I, I hope I was wondering if both of you could could kind of talk about for a moment what how do you see this moment? What is this moment in in climate change? Um, 
you know, presenting itself as what is what is rising to the to the top right now? Um, how should we be thinking about this upcoming set of negotiations? Jonathan? I think this is a great thing to contemplate. I, I think we're at a different place than we've been for much of the, let's call it the last 25 or 30 years of the process. Uh, over much of that history, the world has been involved in trying to figure out what its goals should be. What objectives should it set? It's refined them. Uh, it began with an objective of trying to avoid damage. That wasn't very well defined. That was the climate convention in 1992. It then defined a set of objectives that talked about emissions reductions from a set of countries, mostly those in the OECD. Uh, that was in 1997. You then got to 2015 and it decided, no, no, we have to do a bit more. We should try to get a target for temperature. We should try to stay below two degrees and everyone has to engage. And then we came to Glasgow and we decided actually even that probably wasn't enough. We should make stronger efforts because the science is clearer and the damages are clearer. We should strive to do as much as possible, really seek to hold temperatures below 1.5 degrees if we can. Although the goal wasn't formally changed, the expectation of ambition was raised. And at each of those countries then said, all right, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna make pledges, I'm gonna make commitments. The US has a reduction commitment. China has a net zero by 2060 commitment. Countries step forward and put their pledges on the table. We have those. We don't need to renegotiate those. Those are still right. But where we are today, how do we implement those? What are the barriers to making real what those pieces of paper have set? And I would say a few things have to happen. We know how to do some things quite well. We know how to reduce some of our fossil fuel consumption. We know how to develop more renewable capacity. We know about electric vehicles. We're not quite so sure about steel and cement, but we have some ideas. We're less sure still about how to manage agriculture. We have some ideas there, but they're harder and more difficult to implement. But combined, we have not yet got a process that gets us to net zero. On the US side, you've got this massive new commitment this announcement that was made only a month or so ago from Congress setting us up with a new, uh, a new bill with $370 billion in emissions reductions. That's coupled with a major infrastructure announcement and incorporates a, before that a science announcement and before that an energy policy announcement. In China, you've got this one plus N proposal looking to begin to set concrete policies against the targets set by President Xi and the Chinese government. But in both cases, the details remain to be seen. We have to implement. This is a moment that moves us away from goal setting and into implementing. And we're just at the start of that journey, but we have to do it pretty fast to stay on a reasonable trajectory. Thank you. Jay, how do you see this, this moment? What, what, is, what is COP27 about for, for the Chinese government, for, for people that you speak to in, in China? Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, I'm not in the position uh, to talk about what Chinese government, uh, Chinese government's uh, position, but uh, as an uh, observer uh, outside, uh, I, I would say um, my, my understanding is uh, we should enhance the implementation of our pledge uh, made before. Uh, so as Jonathan said, uh, we we have set up uh, a lot of goals or pledge or targets uh, already. Uh, we have had uh, we have had our NDC targets already, and then uh, I think we are stepping into a new cycle of the negotiation. That 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 uh, the emphasis, uh, I mean, the priority should be uh, looking at uh, to which extent we can achieve our target and the, what barrier, what uh, obstacle we will have and the, what we can learn from each other. I mean, for implementation, including, for example, technological roadmap, uh, investment, uh, policy system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we see, we can change, for, for example, uh, recently US, uh, Congress just passed the, uh, the Information Reduction Act. So we, we saw a lot of uh, similarity uh, from Chinese uh, practice in the past decades for renewable, for electric vehicles, 
And then, but the one thing uh, I'm very curious uh, or very interest, interested in, and uh, oh, this is uh, something for the coming decades in, in the US. But uh, in China, we have experienced, uh, for example, subsidized to electric vehicle uh, in past year, then the, this year will be the end of the, the cycle of the subsidized. So then I'm thinking, oh, should we extend our subsidized uh, mm -hmm. I mean, together with U.S. for electric vehicle, and what's the implication for the pace of electrification of uh, transport, and what's the implication of emission reduction? What's the implication of uh, competition in economic, in, in the market? So those are something we should concentrate more on. But yeah. certainly, I also, I'm also aware of the fact, oh, there are some articles there uh, related to competition, especially related to China. And then let's think how to coordinate that. Uh, so as an economist, uh, I welcome competition. I, I mean, healthy and rule-based uh, competition. Let's coordinate uh, the rule for WHO, uh, for WTO and uh, bilateral uh, and the domestic rules. And uh, all of those issues should be addressed. Uh, uh, Just to ahead. clarify, you're talking about some of the made in America provisions that are part of the, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, rules around around uh, electric battery um, sourcing that are, are in the, the newly passed US legislation, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean? I'm talking about that. I, I mean, but uh, the, uh, I, I, I say, uh, I, I say uh, uh, there are some similarities for domestic policy from Chinese side. And the, this is a big opportunity to explore that, to have a conversation on that, uh, to learn from each other, uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, in the view to enlarge the effectiveness of the policy. So I, I think those will become deeper and the most substantial topics for the negotiation or for conversation, rather than only focusing on target setting. But certainly as a matter of, uh, cycle of the negotiation. And this will give the feedback for the next round update of NDC, I mean target. So, but certainly hopefully those will uh, encourage us uh, to enhance our target for the next round. And yet let me focus for a moment on target setting still. Is there any chance uh, that you see that, that China will enhance its target this year? Um, I think the chance comes from uh, the, uh, uh, the progress in implementation. If you have better and better implementation, uh, cheaper and cheaper cost of renewable vehicle, electric vehicle, and you will build up uh, stronger and stronger com uh, confidence. And then you will have larger and larger opportunity to update your targets. So th this is my... Uh, logical chain to uh, to make that happen. But you don't see it happening this year for this COP? Um, I don't think this year, but um, uh, this year can be part of the process. The, uh, this is the process, but according to the Perry Agreement, I mean, legal uh, cycle uh, for each five year, we will have a, uh, an opportunity to update the uh, 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 the uh, NDC target. So that means it's it should be around 2025. Jonathan, I'd, I'd love for you to comment both on the, the Chinese target, if you think it's sufficient, and, and also the US. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the Inflation Reduction Act and in a moment, but certainly, you know, the US target 50 to 52% below 2005 levels by 2030. There are many that say that the U.S. should actually be going further, given its historic responsibility. Um, any chance that the United States, do you think, will will increase its target this year? So I, I think there's very little chance that that's going to change. I just don't see that in the politics for either country. Uh, I do. I do think, however, that this question of uh, where we are headed is real. Mm -hmm. And I would like to actually fundamentally agree with Soji. I think this question of implementation is pivotal. If it turns out that countries cannot comply with their current targets, they won't be particularly inspired to add to them. 
So in my mind, this is an absolutely central question that both countries will grapple with, and not just the two of us, but the, but the world as a whole. I think the second thing which I'd note is that we're actually, uh, have, we're a bit mixed here in how we're all doing. Uh, I think that there have been some real signals of progress around things like the price of renewables, but there's also been setbacks in terms of near-term energy security dimensions that have driven people back into coal. I don't think that's really a helpful signal for the world. And the open question is, can we overcome that, make that a short-term phenomenon because the price is driven further down and renewables becomes the alternative? I think we have to work on that. I think that question of rapid change is going to be one that could be offset by other circumstances which drive politics in the wrong direction. I want to come back to one other piece, which is this question of trade, because I think that's going to be an increasing area of potential tension. And I think it's going to be something we'll have to grapple with. The EU is worried about it. Uh, we're worried about it with, with other countries as well, not just with China. So there's a larger issue here that's at hand. But I do note that there's also this overarching question of what will it take for countries to take more domestic policy? What are the constraints that they face? What are the kinds of competitive advantages that they see? How do they overcome political objections and barriers? And one of the ways you do that is you find things that your country might seek to adopt and sell those things that way. The process is different in China, but the consequences are similar. If China doesn't see itself as winning from the policies, I don't think it will be able to adopt them. If the US doesn't see itself as winning from the policies, and winning takes multiple forms, it's the form of increased competitiveness, it's domestic jobs, it's economic well being. These are not distinct to one country or another, but unless your policies can demonstrate that to your people, you can't sustain them. So, how now do we overcome these questions of domestic development? and global development. And I think this is a question we're going to have to grapple with. I don't think we've resolved that. I think if we assume that it only happens collectively, we won't move because there are real concerns about the domestic trade agenda. I think if we assume it only happens nationally, we won't be able to do enough because too many of our systems are intertwined. So I think this is going to be a negotiation between trade ministers, between in the WTO, in conversations around domestic implementation, but we shouldn't mistake that for the absence of progress or to assume that things will stop because we grapple with those tensions. Shaji, uh, I mean, the, the China's uh, NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, its, it's emissions target, it's, it has pledged to reach a peak in carbon dioxide emissions by, before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Um, when do you think that peak year will come? Uh, in, in fact, uh, this is a very classic uh, question. So we also read the question to ourselves again mm. and again. Uh, but certainly, uh, I would say uh, it's very uncertain, especially given the uh, uncertain um, external condition. I mean, uh, COVID, uh, uh, Russian Ukraine uh, conflict, uh, uh, recession, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, essentially, I would assume this will fall. I mean, the peaking year will fall uh, into the period of uh, 15 five year uh, plan period that's between 2026 and 2030. Um, but th that there are several determinants there. I mean, not only the emission itself, but also the GDP growth, growth rate, and also um, the energy uh, transition uh, related issue uh, like supply chain, price, et cetera, et cetera, very complicated. But the, uh, the, the I, I mean, the most optimistic uh, judgment is around say, uh, uh, maybe earlier of uh, that 15 five year period. So 2026 to 2027, but the, if it will be later, I mean, um, in 2028 to 2029, I will not be surprised. But the, I, I think now the, the most more important issue is now to the judgment, but the, to create the better uh, condition to make the picking come, the picking years come as early as possible. 
this is the the it seems to me this is the top priority for us. And uh, let's forget the debate of which year you should uh, reach your peak. But uh, let's think about oh, what's the best condition? What's the best action you should take to make the the peaking year earlier? Well, and how high will emissions go before that peak happens is another important part of this, no? Uh, you you mean the peaking level? Sorry. At what level will 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 oh, China's yeah. emissions? Uh, at what level? So it, it's also uncertain. It's also uncertain. But um, uh, I would assume maybe uh, be uh, um, around the. Uh, uh, 11 or 12 billion ton uh, CO2 or something like that. It might be higher, it might be lower, but uh, it, it sounds to be uh, around this range. Jonathan, the, um, the Chinese government officially, you know, at least on Twitter, where things can often be contentious, but on Twitter reacted pretty coolly to the uh, passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the historic climate law, now law, the first major U.S. climate law. Um, I think the China's foreign ministry account uh, uh, quote tweeted the U.S. ambassador to China uh, about the new law saying, good to hear, but what matters is can the U.S. deliver? What what do you make of, of this Kind of reaction is—is is this skepticism warranted? Is it posturing? Is it a little bit of both? I think it's unfortunate. Um, I think that the model for engagement would be improved if there was a recognition that both sides are doing real work. Uh, I think that, uh, in my mind, as I have looked at this issue over the years, this represents a pretty significant departure from any prior effort in the U.S. government. It has several characteristics. It's an enormous amount of money. The largest amount we've previously put into the climate agenda certainly came through the uh, Recovery Act uh, that was at the beginning of Obama at the end of Bush. Uh, that is less than one quarter as big as this. So if you start thinking about scale, this is an extraordinary scale. And one of the objections from the global community historically has been, well, uh, we look at executive action, but we never see anything from Congress that so doesn't have durability. Well, this was a congressional action. So I think that explicitly addresses the constraint that people have perceived. I think that one of the things that is clear, though, is that the U.S. has been, uh, let's call it uh, a seesawing partner. Sometimes it's in and sometimes it's out. And with a country that's not as consistent, it's harder to take for granted that the things they'll do in one term will apply in a second term. So I think there's a legitimate question about implementation. To me, that's starting now. And we're starting to see some things domestically that suggest that there is an enormous amount going on. We're seeing it in two or three domains. The first one is we're seeing significant staffing uh, at the federal level where the obligations to implement start. The second is we're starting to see states, which are likely to be the place for implementation, gearing up to manage resources and to think about their dimensions. And the third is we're starting to see investment from the private sector, which is obviously what we ultimately want, where people are looking at opportunity and looking at making corporate decisions based on federal potentials. None of that's very far along. The whole bill is only a month or so old, so it's it takes some time to put these in motion. But you're already seeing banks making different choices. You're seeing firms entering new markets. You're seeing uh, decisions around future prices as projected by stock market equities rising on the basis of expectations. You're seeing a host of those things move, which give me a great deal more confidence. So then I come to the question of what's the upside for China I think the upside for China would be much greater if China were more enthusiastic, because arguably there's going to be an enormous change in the system. Why would you push back? Well, you're a little skeptical, but you also don't want to be put on the spot. If what you can do is say, listen, we'll see it when it comes, then you can also say, and we'll get to our side once they've delivered. So there's it buys a bit of time. I don't think that holds. I think both sides are aware of the significance I think both sides have made investments. I think that both sides, if they can ever get back together again, which I hope is soon, would be able to take advantage of some of the elements. And there are some clearly spaces where there could be work in common, maybe work in parallel, but work in common that moves the agenda forward. Thank you. Before I go to Jaji, I just want to 
remind folks, I'll be uh, going to your questions in, in just a moment. So if you haven't already sent them in into the, the Q&A, please do. Joji, what, what do you make of the, the sort of early skepticism around the U.S. climate law? Do you, do you share it? Um, what are the conversations like that you've been having in China about the U.S. law? Um, but certainly for the moment, uh, uh, unfortunately, we can only see from internet, from media, uh, but I'm very keen uh, to have the, the in-person communication. But by the way, uh, I will do that uh, in uh, late November and December, I mean, right after COP27, uh, we'll visit to the States uh, to see my old friend, academia and the uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, and the philanthropy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I think for the moment, we should try to create more opportunity to have more and more in-person communication. It, it is very important. Uh, but for, uh, uh, I, and for agenda, I, I mean topics, uh, I think uh, for the moment, we should uh, focus more on investment issues and the fiscal and um, uh, financial issues, uh, because these can be a sort of integration, I mean, between climate agenda and um, uh, economic recovery uh, agenda, uh, those can uh, mobilize uh, larger uh, resources for, I mean, to avoid making some uh, mistakes for our very urgent investment policy. Um, for example, when we try to uh, rescue the economy, uh, which are the top priorities for almost all the country now, and where the investment should flow into. I mean, for example, renewable or um, electric vehicle or um, uh, energy efficiency field or to fossil fuel. So those are the options we have to make choice right now. And I, I think China and the US, we should exchange views on that. And no need to say trade issue uh, might be more and more linked with climate issues. As Jonathan mentioned, we should also uh, keep talking on that and to see in the future, in the coming years, what we can do together in WTO, in G20, in COP, et cetera, et cetera. And then in that way, we de develop our agenda to read the right question, timely question, and then to make the policy uh, align with each other. I'm gonna take questions here. Um, we have one from uh, Kaushik R. Uh, a history question. How did the specific design of the U.S.-China 2014 joint announcement and the 2015 joint statement contribute to increasing the momentum leading toward the Paris Agreement? What lessons did American and Chinese negotiators take from those accords when working on the 2021 Glasgow Joint Declaration? Uh, there's a lot of, uh, let me um, see if I can uh, give a helpful, quick background explanation <laughs> to folks on this. Um, ahead of the Paris Agreement, the United States and China issued a, a statement in which both countries said that they would work uh, to, to tackle climate change. Um, and that sort of laid the groundwork for a lot of these other statements that the questioner is asking about. Let me turn first maybe to Jonathan um, to, to Set the set the table here on on how the what these why these mattered. So I think I think they were absolutely essential. I think they they opened up enormous uh, opportunity. They had huge influence, as the questioner is suggesting, but they had huge influence on the successful outcome of the negotiations. But that has to be taken in context. At the time of these negotiations, conversations between the U.S. and China were moving along. There was something called the strategic and economic dialogue that was in parallel. There was a 10-year framework that was being developed and under which there were negotiations on economic issues and energy policy issues and technology exchanges. 
Uh, and so in some ways, the, the, the circumstances were ripe for agreement. Those have since deteriorated. Those are no longer quite as productive. And so the lessons that we've got, I think, fall into two categories. The first lesson is that there are circumstances where the US and China can find common ground. We did it then when the circumstances were more open. We did it again when the circumstances were not quite as good while we were in Glasgow. So that's just a year ago. And I believe we could do it again now, even though still the circumstances are difficult. I think we have to pick and choose. At that point, we did things like an exchange on cities. We did work through the Energy Department of the US and the Minister of Energy in China on science and technology. Today, we may do slightly different things. We might talk, for example, about opportunities in things like carbon capture. We might talk about agendas that are around policy design for ensuring the reliability of energy supply when we use renewable energy, which is slightly more intermittent. But we probably won't do technology things where there's huge competition. We won't do things in which there's a perceived national security interest on either side. I think that still leaves real windows that we can engage. I think we have to find them. I think the Glasgow Declaration offers a few, some of which we could still move on. For example, the methane work was an area of agreement. We talked about doing work in forests and land use where both countries are making real strides and the exchange of information could benefit third parties. Agriculture and land use, after all, is almost 30% of global emissions. So there are real areas that we could still cooperate, which wouldn't be constrained by the disagreements between the countries. I think that's the lesson that I would take. So, G, any anything that on your end? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we do need to record uh, the history of the, the joint statement between China and the U.S. in uh, 2014. Uh, there are a lot of uh, lessons learned and experienced. Uh, we should uh, uh, think deeper. Uh, so, but I would say certainly the context is totally different. I mean, between uh, that time and today. Uh, I, I would emphasize the trust level, uh, political trust. I, I think at that time, uh, the two sides, we have uh, adequate trust level. Uh, I mean, from high level leader to working level, although uh, we have very uh, extreme debate sometimes, I remember very clearly, uh, uh, Jonathan and myself, we fight, we fight it. Uh, in the negotiation, uh, he said, oh, Zhou Ji, do not uh, concentrate on history too much. Just uh, look at tomorrow, look, look forward. And I said, oh, we should consider historic responsibility, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, uh, although we have different views uh, for many things in the negotiation, but uh, I trust him, he trusts me, and our leaders trust each other. And uh, uh, I mean, after meeting, uh, we go to cafe, we have dinner together, we are friends. And um, so I, I mean, the context is, is different. Uh, no need to say uh, for the, some fundamental issue, uh, we have a shared vision, shared uh, uh, common ground, as Jonathan said. Uh, but today, I, I see uh, I mean, today's negotiator, they have uh, more challenging condition to work together, uh, especially for the uh, political environment. And uh, but th that means uh, we should try to request our politician to leave um, adequate room for the negotiator to work together. That means they should control the trust level. Although we have some new emerging issue to debate, have different views, no problem. But never forget, uh, I mean, do not make the trust level too low. Uh, otherwise, uh, there will be a very strong spillover effect uh, on all the things, including uh, climate, uh, climate issue. We have a question uh, from a, a PhD student from Peking University who asks, how can the US and China cooperate 
to mobilize those countries with wavering com commitment like India. Uh, Jajji, do you agree? Do you think that India has a wavering commitment? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and more specifically to, to this uh, person's question, can, can the US and China together influence other countries to do more? Um, but certainly, uh, I think uh, uh, if China and the U.S. can cooperate, and, and our cooperation is effectively uh, smooth, uh, at least uh, this is a, a sort of a showcase or demonstration to other countries. This is number one. Number two, uh, our if our cooperation can show more solution, more way out, more pathway, uh, this will encourage other countries, I mean, for technology, for policy, for finance. Uh, in that way, uh, I think uh, our cooperation can encourage uh, other countries, including uh, India, and also create more opportunity to work with India together, to cooperate with India. For example, for solar, for green finance, for uh, green manufacturing, for investment, trade, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, this is the way for a better or healthy interaction between China, US, and the China plus U, uh, US uh, uh, together with India. Um, we have a, a question about the, the energy crisis. Um, Many, because of the energy crisis, are, the questioner says many countries are moving back to fossil fuels. How do you think about the long-term impact of these actions to the climate? Jonathan, let me start with you on this. So I think the open question is how long does it last? Mm. Uh, and I don't think we know. I think that's a really, uh, uh, you know, the, the critical thing. If it lasts uh, for only a year or so and that the tensions subside, uh, I'm not ever sure that natural gas prices revert to the levels that they, they were at before the invasion, but they may slightly re recede and uh, uh, some of the tensions around moving to coal in particular might be easier to manage. Having said that, there's also some incentives that are being provided because of these high gas prices, including in Europe, but also including globally, where countries are accelerating the transition away from fossil fuels. And they're simultaneous. So Europe may be looking to start up some old coal plants, but it's hoping those will only run for a year or so as it accelerates its transition to renewable energy and can then retire the coal plants. China's had a slightly different model. It's uh, actually increased some of its coal recently because of supply and demand constraints, but China's developing renewables faster than any other country in the world. And so the question is, which one wins? Will the demand grow faster than the availability of supply from renewables? If renewables grows faster, China will shut down its coal. And there's an incentive now because of increasing global prices on fossil fuels to do that. But I don't think we know. I'm optimistic that the price increase will drive a more rapid penetration of renewables. We have to think about a couple of pieces. We want to think about security, which is driving many, many countries' concerns. That's economic security and supply stability. We have to think about cost to the consumer. The cost has gone up extraordinarily in most countries around the world because of supply constraints. And we have to think about longevity and reliability of supply when you replace something else. So for example, if we can do a better job at managing grid variability, we'll see a much, much deeper decline in both gas and coal use globally. So I think those are the questions we have to manage. Shashi, we last year at the the at COP26 in Glasgow, there was a, a huge, you know, end of end of session fight over phasing out or phasing down inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and countries landed on phasing down. Do you think that this year, with this context of, of the energy crisis and countries, you know, eyeing fossil fuels again? in new ways that we could even get to that wording? Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, as the former negotiators, uh, I, now I do not care too much, uh, very much uh, about the wording, uh, uh -huh. about the language phase down or phase out. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, 
uh, I would say uh, we should have deeper and deeper understanding on the process for the transition, for energy transition. Just uh, again, take coal as a, uh, as a major examples. So when we say, oh, we, anyway, we should uh, reduce coal. And then we, we should think how long, in, in, what, what's the time frame for, for that? So what's the major determinant for that process? What's the pace, the speed for that? Uh, and uh, so, for example, talking about the uh, China's process for transition, I would say, oh, this is not something happening in one night. Uh, we need uh, one, two decades to ensure the uh, smooth, uh, uh, stable, uh, and uh, safe uh, transition, uh, but to, together with the increase of renewable or non-fossil fuel, uh, etc., uh, and also for for fuel itself. So the the recent let's learn from Europe is um, uh, so number one. Uh, let me also uh, uh, coming back to the question from Peking University, uh, Mr. Yang Lei. Uh, I mean, what's the, the impl uh, implication of the, the, the energy crisis? I would say, uh, I, I saw from the, the media, oh, uh, Germany, they re recovered some uh, coal-fired power plant. But I, I would say uh, this is temporary uh, measures, not uh, long-term uh, measures. So it just uh, play a role, uh, I mean, for, uh, for disaster. Uh, uh, assessment, uh, 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 treatment. And uh, that means uh, you can leave some capacity, coal, fire power plant capacity, but uh, in normal case, you, you do not generate electricity with that. But in some very extreme case, you can use that as a backup, backup. that's all. So this will lead to very, very little uh, emission. Um, so uh, this is the lesson learned, but to never believe, oh, these will be a uh, long-term uh, 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 trends. Uh, uh, in contrast, uh, my understanding is the final, final way out for energy security is renewable. And uh, I also learned uh, from uh, my European colleagues, they now they speed up uh, the pace for renewable uh, development, uh, I mean, for uh, five year or 10 year uh, uh, time frame. Uh, and also, I also saw one, one very immediate evidence that the export of solar panel from China to Europe, um, uh, I mean, increased 146% in the past eight months. So that showed anyway, we should move to renewable, uh, essentially, for, for that. I'm still stuck on your comment that these fights over words don't matter. <laughs> phase down, phase out. <laughs> um, that. But uh, let's look, look back to the market, to the real economy. Yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, for example, in China, if you can ensure, uh, I mean, to control stringently, the, the, the incremental investment in coal mining, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, coal-fired power plant capacity, and then you, you enlarge your uh, renewable investment, and then uh, your increase of energy or electricity will be covered more and more by renewable. And the, to this turning point, there will be no need to increase your, your coal and the coal fire power plant. So th 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 that's the real process. We have time, unfortunately, for only one more question. Let me take this one um, from Zhou Zhang. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the questioner asks, what's the key piece missing from climate policies on both sides? Um, I think this is a, a great question. And let's keep in mind the goal, the goal the countries have all agreed to which is to keep global rising, global average temperatures from rising beyond 1.5 from pre-industrial levels. Um, we're, we're right now not on track. No country, nobody is on track 
to do that. Now that both of you are out of government, what is the, the you know, if you can boil it down to one thing that you wish your government was doing, that it is not, that it could, what would it be? Shoji, can we start with you? Uh, in short, I, but certainly I would wish both governments, uh, I mean, Chinese government and the US government to keep uh, openness to each other as more as possible. Why? Because uh, climate issue is a global issue. We do need the globalization in terms of trade, technology, finance to address that, to share uh, our technology in, to share our ideas, uh, our experience and lesson learned. In that way, we can lower the global cost of abatement, uh, I mean emission abatement. And in that way, we will build up larger and stronger confidence to uh, speed up the agenda of global climate and also to enhance our ambition. So uh, this is my fundamental uh, idea. Jonathan, what is for you the, the missing piece in, in US climate policy? What would you like to see the US doing to, that is not yet doing? So I think there's uh, two parts of my answer. The first one is what I'd like to see the US do with China. And the second might what the US do. On the first part of what it does with China, I would like the US and China to agree that climate change is too important not to take on at the most aggressive possible level. If we look at future damages and risks from climate change, they dwarf almost any other catastrophe we can imagine. I don't think of anything that I've ever seen so far in, in history that's been the equivalent of 30 million people displaced by one flood. That is one flood in one country before we even get to 1.5 degrees of temperature rise. That is the best it's gonna be, not the worst. And for me, if we can't put aside differences and move on this agenda, we're gonna have much, much more disaster to come. The second question is what could the US do individually? And I think that's about implementation. I think the US is gonna to have to implement the agenda that it's set for itself in order to move to the next level of ambition. Because we should be clear, this gets us a big piece of the way to the 50 to 52, but the 50 to 52 is only part of what we have to do to get to zero. And I think that's a trajectory that requires success on the implementation side. I want to thank both of you so much for a really just a, a wonderful and important discussion. Uh, I hope everyone will give both of our panelists a virtual round of applause. And I would like to invite Juan to give our closing remarks. It was fantastic. Thank you so much, G, Jonathan, and Lisa for such an engaging conversation. I also want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I hope that you found the conversation as insightful as I did. I would like to invite all of you to the upcoming panel discussion entitled A Humanistic Approach to Climate Change on Tuesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. Central Time, Wednesday, October 19th, at 8 a.m. China Standard Time. Thank you very much. Good evening and good day to you.